This is study number six, entitled Jesus the Savior. This is a tremendous study, folks. I love this study. And I know you do too. It's something we can wrap our arms around and have a sense of praise and thanksgiving to the God who made this study possible. The essence or the basic teaching of it. Jesus the Savior. And as I thought about this, I thought of the announcement of Christ coming by the angel. And uh, listen to how it goes. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy which will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. What a tremendous announcement. Good news of great joy. So <laughs> we want to, you know, put our, our, our arms around this with a sense of praise to God and a sense of joy in our heart. And I say that because it's so true, but also because I know that some of us have grown up from, I mean, I remember that verse from saying it in a play in a Christmas time thing in the church when I was knee high to a grasshopper, see? And so we've heard the story. We've heard it and heard it preached and we read it and it's been in our Sunday school lessons. And sometimes familiarity takes off the edge of the grandeur and the awesomeness of it. But God's Holy Spirit should not allow that to happen to us. And so we need to pinch ourselves a little bit and say, wow, what it would be like if we would hear this message for the first time. Wouldn't that be awesome in terms of what that would mean for us? Because in this picture, we have, first of all, the, the tremendous waterfall and the great chasm that all looks like trouble big big trouble and that is the first item of our teaching picture that we want to underscore that dramatically reminds us that humankind has a king-sized predicament that waterfall and that chasm portrays the human predicament. And all we need to do, because we're people who have come through the Old Testament, is to remind ourselves of which study in the Old Testament. It's number three. And you recall that it was preceded by that study on divine intentions. And it told about the paradise situation, harmony with God, with self, with others, and with nature. And now, in this picture, we have God's full-blown explanation, a full-blown presentation of his answer to the dilemma that was caused when humankind disobeyed and they lost that harmony. Picture number three says, we became separated from God, estrangement from God. The primary harmony of those four is harmony number one, you, I, and I all know that that's the tap root. And out of that, the other harmonies uh, also disintegrate if the first and primary one is lost. <clears throat> so that is essentially what we're looking at. And here is God's answer and presentation to it. Now, <clears throat> these broken boats along the shore of the chasm and by the big rocks here are apt symbols of the fact that throughout history humankind has come up with a lot of devices to deal with that human predicament. All we need to do is to go back into the history of civilization and we find that every civilization has had some kind of a religion, some kind of a ritual whereby they would seek to get on good terms with what they had a sense was a supreme being. And so they have some kind of a religion. And sad to say, a lot of these religions uh, 
offer the wrong kind of way of getting to be on good terms with God. Okay? So that you find sacrifice, but many times it's sacrifice of children, infanticide. That was true in the Canaanite religions. And you recall how Jesus said, uh, how, how the Lord said through, uh, through Moses, I don't want any more of this. You, I'm driving these people out because they're doing this. And I don't want you to do this. This is not the kind of sacrifice we're looking for. You'll notice in our Old Testament study, there was a pursuit of trying to deal with spiritual issues, of getting on good terms with God through the occult. And in that same passage in Deuteronomy 18, God said, I don't want that either. That's not how it is to be done. So people in all these kinds of ways in generations past have try to deal with the human dilemma. And this study reminds us that they are false attempts. They're like broken boats. And when Jesus came on the scene, one of the devices I think that is still very, very prevalent that people have used through the years is to try to get on good terms with God by obeying a certain kind of a set of rules and regulations. And that was true for the scribes and the Pharisees and what they promoted. And bottom line, they believed you get on good terms with God by meticulously obeying the law. And Jesus said to them, but you have lost the key to knowledge. That's in that passage that we looked at in uh, a couple of studies ago, Luke 11.52. Luke 11.52, you have lost the key to knowledge. And he said, you will not enter the kingdom of God because you've lost it. The key to knowledge, as we explained in that study, is God's answer. His answer is the Messiah. That was prefigured in the Old Testament through all the sacrificial system. And when Jesus came on the scene, John the Baptist, who knew his Old Testament, said, as he pointed to Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God, the Lamb to be sacrificed, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God didn't change his plan. It's just that now it comes to its fullness. That's what we have in this study. These broken boats. Now, you'll notice that this particular picture shows a man clinging to the cross. The cross that bridges the gap, the chasm between the waterfall and what you find here uh, is a beautiful scene. And we'll explain what that beautiful scene's about a little bit later, but you've read about it before you came to class, so you already know. That refers to the promise of what the kind of life that God has in store for those that will do what this man is doing, cling to the cross. So what does that man symbolize? He symbolizes the fact that God, in the person of Jesus Christ, has dealt directly and effectively with the human dilemma. That's God's plan and purpose and will. Man messed it up through disobedience, and God said, in effect, I will come, and I will give you a costly sacrifice to me as an avenue whereby you can be redeemed, and what you've messed up can be restored. You recall the story that we talked about uh, a year ago. Uh, it was about C.S. Lewis. Uh, the anniversary of his birth was celebrated. And uh, the narrative, a true story, about a council, a conference was held in England on world religions, comparative religions. And C.S. Lewis got to the conference late. And the debate had been going on. And when he stepped in, he couldn't 
hook in to find out what they were debating, what was the essential question. And you recall how he asked the question, what is it that you're debating? And they said, we are debating what makes the Christian faith different, unique, special, in the midst of all the other religions of the world. And they had debated it for some time without coming up with an answer. And C.S. Lewis said, the answer is G-R-A-C-E, grace. Now, I'm sure that's not how he said it, but that's what he said. Grace is what makes the Christian faith special, unique, so that it is not numbered among the broken boats. Because the broken boats deal with man's effort. And grace says, God does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We can't merit it. We can't earn it. Only God can provide it. And it's our place to receive it. And that's what this man does. He clings to the cross. And it reminds us of that hymn writer who said, uh, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. <laughs> it's, it's the word. So, we come to look at that and ask ourselves the question, does the scripture indicate that there are alternate ways to be saved? Every year for the past about five years in Orange County, we have had uh, scheduled, as I read the religion paper on a uh, section of the uh, paper on Saturday, uh, what they call a, a, uh, a religion fair. And various presenters come and present their faith, their religion. And one of those presentations would be a presentation of the Christian faith. So, uh, do all people believe what this story, what this teaching picture is about? And the answer is no, they don't. Uh, what does the scripture say is, is really the North Star. What does the Bible say about this? So we, we come back again, do we not, friends, with that basic uh, presupposition that our North Star is the Holy Scripture. Why do you believe what you believe? It must be because God has revealed it to be so. And where has he revealed it? In the word written, that's the Holy Scripture. And in the word made flesh, where you have the portrayal of what God is like and what he wants in the person of Jesus Christ. And once again, that's portrayed for us in Scripture. That's our North Star. And so, let's read these passages that speak to this question. Are there alternate avenues of salvation beside what that man is clinging to? So let's take a look at the sections. First of all, Acts 14, 6, probably the best known. And in that passage of scripture, you've got the words of Jesus Christ. And you could probably repeat it without even looking at the reference where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Uh, Jesus said it, and I accept it. Take a look at the next one. This is now in the book of Acts. And uh, you have uh, the early apostles, the followers of Jesus Christ, being cornered by the uh, religious establishment. And you have this statement. When they are asked the question, why are you doing what you're doing, proclaiming Jesus Christ as the Messiah? They say, there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name in all of heaven for people to call on to save them. Again, isn't that a rather clear statement? I definitely think it is. Then you move on to uh, 1 Timothy. And uh, as your worksheet gives the reference, it's 1 Timothy 2, 5. And again, I'll read it for you. It is good and pleases God our Savior 
for he wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Uh, I would say that's a good verse to underline. There you've got the heart of God. He wants everyone to be saved. And when the an angel announced that Christ was born, he said it is good news with great joy for all people, all people. That's the heart of God. His heart is as big as the world. God so loved the world. All right, now verse 5. Out of that love, he prescribes a way. For there is only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and people. He is the man, Christ Jesus. Again, isn't that a clear, clear statement? And finally, we go to the epistles of John. And there in the fifth chapter of the first epistle, on the twelfth verse, we have this statement. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Life is in his Son. And then he goes on to, to nail it down, saying, So whoever has God's Son has life, and whoever does not have his Son does not have life. Well, those are some of the key passages that speak to this question. Uh, last April, uh, a pamphlet or a booklet that I subscribed to came to uh, my desk, and it had a research project result uh, from one of the mainline denominations that we would all be very familiar with in our country. And they did a research on this very question. How many people in the denomination believe, number one, that only followers of Jesus Christ can be saved? This research project came up with the following result. 60% of the people in that mainline Christian Protestant denomination, 60% said yes. 20% said, we're not sure. And 20% said, no, there are many ways to heaven. Christ is one among many ways to God. Okay? So, I'm sure that when we come across discussions and debates, that we're going to find people who say that is a very intolerant attitude that you talk about. Christ is the way. What do our, our documents of, of the church of which we're a part, the Reformed Church in America, say? Well, I hold in my hand a booklet that you'll be reading for your Christian doctrine course. It includes the ecumenical creeds and then the three confessions that are part of the standards of the Reformed Church in America, the Heidelberg Catechism, the Belgian Confession, and the Canons of, of Dort. Okay? Now, let me read an article from the Belgian Confession, Article 26. What does our standard say with regard to this? We believe that we have no access to God except through the one and only mediator and intercessor, Jesus Christ the righteous. And I quote from the Belgian Confession, article number 26. <coughs> what we're going to do now is to have an open discussion time. So with this, we will break and move into our discussion. All right, we begin study uh, number six and segment two. And in this segment, we're going to take a look at the next items in the teaching picture. And under number four in your worksheet, you'll find out that there's attention paid to the rocks, these sharp rocks that are found in the uh, stream of water in the chasm here. One, two, three, sharp rocks. And what do they mean? What are they there for? They're there to remind us that God's action in Jesus Christ deals with three very 
stubborn, and big problems. And the first problem is the problem of separation. Now, we're not talking now about the concept of separation as a people that are, should be separated so God can build into their lives so that they can be sent out into the world. We're dealing now with the separation that is found in study number three of the Old Testament. The primary problem of humankind is the fact that when we disobey, we separate ourselves from God. That's the separation. The loss of that harmony not being on good terms with God. And so that is the nub of the human predicament. Are we ready to meet our maker? It's a question. And there's something deep down in the side of the hearts of people that makes them feel uneasy about that. Are we ready? They're not sure. So the problem of separation has got to be addressed and that is looked at head on in the Christ event. Take a look at your paper. First of all, you've got self-imposed separation. And you find that so clearly portrayed in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. And you read in that third chapter where you have them disobeying God and uh, you, you read, Toward evening they heard the Lord walking about in the garden. So what did they do? Hey, glad to see you. Wow, where you been? No, 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 no. They hid themselves among the trees. Genesis 3.8. And so that's that uneasy conscience inside of us saying, I know I'm not on good terms with my Lord. And then take the one just above that, there is a God-imposed separation. And you can just read that other section of chapter 3 in Genesis. So God banished Adam and his wife from the Garden of Eden. They lost their paradise. They were no longer fit to walk in God's presence. And the prophet Isaiah really succinctly dealt with this issue of separation, that, that impasse between God and disobedient humankind. And he said, your sins have made a separation between you and your God. So we ask the question, well, why is that? I mean, can't God just kind of say, if we're coloring outside the lines, I, I haven't even noticed it? Can't God just kind of sweep it under the rug? Can't he be kind of a easygoing sugar daddy type? Or why is he uh, overly uptight about this matter of, of, of us not really, you know, living as we should? Why can't he be a little bit easier on us? Well, what does the Bible have to say about that? Friends, I think that when we talk in the terms that I've just talked about, that we have tried to domesticate God. We have tried to bring him into the kind of God that we feel we can deal with. That's what's going on there. But I don't want to mess with that. I want to know the God as he really is. That's where we need to be. And the Bible everywhere presents that God is a holy God. God is a holy God. And he cannot countenance sin and sinful people into his presence. It just doesn't work any more than you can mix oil and water. And I turn now to that passage in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. It's such a wonderful passage which highlights the holiness of God and the sinfulness of humankind. And I'll read it for you. I saw the Lord, writes Isaiah. He was riding on a loft, sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. 
Hovering around him were mighty seraphim. In great chorus they sang, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Then I said, My destruction is sealed for me, because I am a sinful man and a member of a sinful race. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord God Almighty. Now we got God's response, his action. This is the heart of God's grace. Then one of the seraphim flew over to the altar. The altar refers to where God's blessing and grace flows. He flew over to the altar and he picked up a burning coal with a pair of tongs and he touched my lips with it and he said, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed, your sins are forgiven. There you've got God's response to man's penitence, God's grace of forgiveness. That's required. Now notice how it finishes up. And then I heard the Lord saying, Who shall I send as a messenger to my people? Who will go for us? And I said, Lord, I'll go, send me. What a wonderful passage. See? <laughs> there you've got the human dilemma. God's holiness, human sinfulness, God's answer symbolized by the coal from the altar, man's forgiveness, receiving of God's grace, and then in gratitude and thankfulness saying, here am I, send me. It's almost like Saul on the road to Damascus, Lord, what do you want me to do? See, that's the biblical pattern. That's the biblical pattern. So there you have the whole matter. And I want to wrap up by this particular point by reading that section from the book of Colossians, which really states this whole matter of separation and God's answer to it in such wonderful words. And the passage that I uh, list for you there is Colossians 1, 19 through 22. And uh, it reads as follows. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And by him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of his blood on the cross. See, that's reconciliation. That's the answer to separation. That's the answer to estrangement. That's the answer to not being on good terms with God. Reconciliation, and that's what Paul writes God has accomplished in Jesus Christ and the blood of the cross. And I conclude that reading with these words. This includes you who were once so far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has brought you back as what? Friends. Wow. He has done this through his death on the cross in his own human body. As a result, he has brought you into the very presence of God. Eden restored, now in the presence of God. And uh, now listen to these words. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Does it get any better than that, folks? <laughs> I mean, this is... This is such great news. This is just wonderful. There's no other faith that gives that kind of wonderful news. And you can say, well, uh, is it really going to be true? Is it really going to deliver what it says? And all God's people said, yes, yes, yes. That's an act of faith when we put our lives in his hands. And I know it's true. I know, I know, I know. The reason we know is because God's Holy Spirit witnesses to our human spirit. John Calvin says that one of the reasons you know that the Bible is true in its promises is the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. That's his words. Internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit witnesses to our Holy Spirit 
that is right. That is what happens in your life when you are go through the Gospels, and you do your New Testament reading, and you precede that with prayer, and you're for real as you're listening to what God is saying, what happens inside of us as we, we do this is God's Spirit confirming to our spirits. We may have heard it before. We may have underlined it before. But now God is afresh strengthening us. And His Holy Spirit is testifying to our human spirit that that is true. And that's wonderful and that's good. So I hasten on to look at the second rock. The second rock is another very big and important rock, and it deals with the question of guilt and a sense of guilt. So the passages that I've just read from Isaiah and then Colossians chapter 1, where it talks about being blameless before God, friends, those passages tell us that we have no guilt before God. We're before Him blameless. He cannot accuse us of anything. All of that has been atoned for. God made Christ sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We stand before Him as righteous people. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. See, this, this is something you, you, you don't find in any other avenue of life. This is the good news. This is the good news. So we stand before him faultless. It is just, uh, uh, just really something, something wonderful. Uh, I, I love the, another passage of scripture. I'm going to take a second to read it. It's a last verse in the book of Jude. It's a, it's a benediction is what it is. And now all glory to God who is able to keep you from stumbling and who will bring you into his glorious presence innocent of sin and with great joy. We don't have to be afraid of coming to meet the Lord in that day when he takes us home. We can come into his presence with joy. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. So, he takes away guilt and he takes away a sense of guilt. Now, what's the difference between these two things? Guilt or guilty, put the word guilty in parenthesis because it may help you here, is God's verdict on sinful humanity. We fall short. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The verdict that comes out of that from God is guilty until we have someone, namely Jesus Christ, to take our sin and atone for it. We stand as guilty. All right? That's why this man is clinging to the cross, because he knows that's the only way that atonement for sin is satisfied and taken care of. That's God's prescription. God said, this is the way I will do it. And we say, I don't totally understand it, but I accept it. Because you have said, that's it. That's the way that sin is atoned for. Okay, so that's what guilt is. It is God's verdict on human sinfulness. And that verdict is there as being guilty unless and until it is removed. And the only way it gets removed is through God's prescription, namely through His Son and the cross that He endured in our behalf. Okay, so that's what guilt is. Now what is a sense of guilt? A sense of guilt is our awareness of that verdict that God has given to humankind who has sinned. Okay? Got that? When we come to the very end of our, our study, we're going to have a discussion in terms of that, because that is such a rich and uh, important area. And so he saves us from guilt and a sense of guilt. And I put in your worksheet 
three sayings from the lips of Jesus Christ that help us to understand what guilt is. Guilt is defined over against the holiness of God. <coughs> guilt is defined not just by outward actions, but by the heart, our innermost being. And guilt is also defined by not our feelings, but by the fact. In other words, when you come to this part in the Gospels where you have the Pharisee and the publican going to, to the temple to pray, okay, you remember that section? And the publican was humble and he asked for God's forgiveness. And the Pharisee was arrogant. He had feelings of self-righteousness because he felt he was going to make it on the basis of his good behavior. And Jesus gave that little story and he said, now which of these two people are justified in the eyes of God? Is the person who had good feelings about himself, even to the point of arrogance and a self-righteous spirit, or the person who knew that he was a sinner and looked for God's grace? Well, it's the latter, Jesus very clearly said. So feelings are not the basis on which God's verdict of guilt is decided. That was the mistake of the Pharisee. It is based on God's verdict, not our feelings as to how good we might think we are. So those are the points that we want to break, uh, make with regard to that second stone on guilt and a sense of guilt. And with that, we're going to take a break, and uh, we'll discuss this later in the uh, session. All right, we move now into the third segment of our study on Jesus the Savior, and we look at the third rock, and we're pointing out that these are tough, big issues that confront everybody and are part of the human dilemma, and God in Jesus Christ addresses every last one of these problems. The third rock that is listed here is the addictiveness of sin and evil. The addictiveness of sin and evil. In other words, we live in a sinful world. We ourselves are people that get involved in sinning. And when we say yes to Jesus, we'd like to believe <clears throat> that all of that would be done. And automatically a switch would be thrown and we would no longer have a struggle with regard to sinning and evil. But we know that that's not true. We know that this continues to be an issue. And Christ has indicated that he has provision but he first of all says, take a look at that stone. Take a look at what this is really about in your life. And I uh, give you the reference in John 8, verse 34. Jesus said, I assure you that everyone who sins is a, what? Slave to sin. That passage, along with others, indicates that sin is not just a neutral factor. Sin has a way of enslaving us. It has a way of becoming addictive. And we sometimes think that, uh, well, I can see that in the drug culture. Uh, I can see that when people get tied into alcohol. Uh, I can see that with, and you name a particular pronounced antisocial behavior, that people become addicted to it. But Jesus indicates that sin, just in its garden variety of things and activities, is something that is addictive. And maybe we haven't thought about that sufficiently, but those are the words of Christ, enslaved to sin. Now, as we move a little further on into the, the, the New Testament, especially in the letters of Paul, 
we're going to discover what that garden variety type thing is in terms of our struggle to live the way Christ wants us to live, looks like in our life. And it'll be different for all of us because we all have our certain propensities and Satan knows where those vulnerable spots are and he works on him. It may be in our thought life, it may be in the words we speak, it may be in our attitude or behavior, you know, it could be any number of things. But Satan begins to edge his way in and to take control and then we begin to repeat that kind of behavior. It's addictive. And so take a look at the note in the study Bible with regard to this particular verse and I'll read it for you. Sin has a way of enslaving us, controlling us, dominating us, dictating our actions. Jesus can free you from this slavery that keeps you from becoming the person God created you to be. That's a good note. That's right on. Now, have we given enough attention to that third rock? I suspect maybe we haven't. I suspect maybe we haven't. So what does Jesus say in the Gospels? Pray that you enter not into temptation. I have prayed that you will be faithful, he said to people, because Satan's going to sift you. But I'm praying for you. Prayer is a highly significant thing. So if we take that prayer that we ended up with last week, Lord, help me to see myself as you see me. We really need to pray that because we have blinders on. I do. I think all of us do. And we need to have a 2020 vision with regard to where Satan has got an inroad and where we really do not give a good portrayal of what it means to be a person following Jesus. All right, so now we have a candid shot of our life and we know where the vulnerable spots are and where we fall short. And then we can pray, Lord, I'm having a struggle in this area. If you're in a small group and you get to know each other well enough and you can share some of the intimate things about your own personal struggle and your own walk with life, that's important to do. And you get a brother and sister who will team up with you and link with you in prayer. There's great power where people will be that honest to God and to each other and ask God to enter in with his power. Who's the strongest, Satan or God? God. No contest. Are we taking that seriously? Another passage that we're going to look at more in depth as we move further into the New Testament is Ephesians 5.18. And I'll quote it for you. Do not get drunk with wine, which is debauchery, but keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's probably the King James translation. But now let me read it for you in the New Living Translation. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, let the Holy Spirit fill you, and now notice this addition, and control you. Okay? Now the Bible teaches that we have an old nature that we inherit from Adam. And that old nature is what Satan works on because that is tuned to make us stumble. The old nature is that which wants to divert our attention from God's power and from God's way and to get us into the ways of the world. That's what the old nature is all about. We're born with that. We are born with a propensity to sin. That may not be good news, but it's real truth. And you must put alongside of it God's grandeur of grace and glory and strength and power. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, writes Paul in Ephesians 6. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers in high places. He took it seriously, and so did Jesus, and we ought to too. And so what does this passage say? Paul in this passage says, 
Keep on being filled with the Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit control you. Now, friends, that talks about the new nature. When we say yes to Jesus, God, we become a new creation. And that new creation is the new nature which God gives to us. And that is side by side with the old nature. And God says, now here are the avenues whereby the Holy Spirit can control you in your word, in your actions, in your thoughts. Keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit, but God does not cause the Spirit to just pervade a person's life with all of his wonderful, gracious, controlling power unless we want it. You have not because you ask not. Jesus said when he talked about the Spirit, you must hunger for it and thirst for it. In the John passage, Jesus talks about this. We'll look at that a little bit more in depth later on too, but just take it for me that that's what Jesus said. You have to hunger and thirst in order for God's Holy Spirit to take control of your life. And then you won't be controlled by the things of the old nature. No contest when God gets involved, see. Now, obviously, God, as I already alluded to, wants us not just to pray, but to find the support of people who can be prayer uh, helpers and warriors with us. Uh, that's what the body is about. God works through other people to bring us that kind of support. We need to be able to check in. How are you doing today? And maybe you need to do it every day if there is something that has really gotten a hold of you. Those are the ways in which God enables us to deal with that third rock. The third rock is the threat and the power of evil. And that's the world we live in. And God says, I've dealt with it. Appropriate what I can provide for you to walk the right way. So we move from that, and we go into the three graves, one, two, three, along uh, the side of the rushing stream there in the chasm. Now, what obstacle are we looking at here that Christ has dealt with on the cross? It has to do with spiritual death. Now, let's take a look at the three kinds of death that are portrayed here spiritual death, temporal death, and eternal death, okay? Now, if you'll just think with me for a little while, I think if you have questions as to how they're different and what they are, uh, it should be get clarified. The, the major concept here is spiritual death. And the subtitles under that, the subcategories under that are temporal death and eternal death. All right, now walk with me back into the Garden of Eden. All right, God gave clear indication that they were not to eat of that tree. And Satan comes along and he said, did God really tell you that in the day you eat thereof you shall surely die? Yeah, well, God's pulling your leg. All right, so there's the temptation. And what happens is that they eat, they disobey is really the nub of what transpired there. Now what happens? Did they die on the spot? That passage is not really talking about physical death. We all understand what physical death is. Physical death is the time when soul and body are separated. Spiritual death is a time when soul and God are separated. Which happened? They were ushered out of the garden. They were separated from God. That's the primary meaning of what that death is about. That is spiritual death, to be separated from God. All right, now let's move on into the New Testament. And I give you the references here in terms of how uh, the Bible teaches in the, in the book of Romans, in particular, chapter 5, when Adam sinned, sin entered the entire human race. That's what you call inherited sin. And Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone. Reading the quote as given in your worksheet. <clears throat> now, so we 
Let's move from the Garden of Eden into our life. All right. Let's hypothetically talk in terms of being without Christ for a moment. All right. We inherit from Adam and Eve spiritual death. This is what Paul meant when he said that we are dead in trespasses and sins. Out of step with God. Spiritually not alive. Not a good prospect. All right. That is what you call temporal death. Do you follow that? You can be physically alive and spiritually dead. That's called temporal death. Okay. That happens in this life for people apart from Jesus Christ dealing with that grave. All right, now move that a catch further. Jesus went on and said that uh, he who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. What is Jesus talking about there? He's talking about the fact that you don't have to live as temporally dead, spiritually dead in this life. You can say yes to Jesus. And when you say yes to Jesus, you become spiritually alive. And you are now in a saving faith relationship to Jesus Christ. See? That's the good news that Jesus is announcing. And then you may physically die, but you don't really die because spiritually you go on to live with Jesus Christ now by faith as over against by faith. First by faith and then by sight. But for those, sadly, who do not, those who are temporarily dead, that is to say spiritually out of tune with God, no spiritual aliveness. They're dead in sin. They, sadly enough, can move into eternity that way. And then that temporal death becomes an eternal death. Do you follow <laughs> the trickiness of those words? So, okay. <laughs> you know, that's how that's all shaken out. But at any rate, there you have the three graves. Spiritual death, temporal death, and eternal death. And God said in Jesus Christ on Easter we have the resurrection news. As an Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. That's the good news. He has dealt a blow to Satan and to sin and to death. Those trilogy. <laughs> Satan, sin, and death. And these graves refer to the fact that people can be walking on two legs, maybe look like they have a good life and a good time, but if they're not in tune with Jesus, the Bible says they're not spiritually alive. And they need to hear about Jesus Christ and say yes to him. And then they know that they are alive spiritually. Being they need never, never die. Death is no tragic event. It is a graduation into a fuller life. That's the Easter news. And with that thought, we're going to cut for discussion time. We move now to the last segment, the fourth segment of our study about Jesus, the Savior. And we look now at the cross. The cross that bridges this chasm and leads us to the area here that portrays the abundant life that Christ provides for those that say yes to him. So this man who clings to that cross saying this is God's answer and I accept God's answer. I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord now makes his way across the chasm using the cross of Christ and begins, the word is begins to live the life as God originally intended it to be. So you've got to see the whole framework of the Old Testament study number two, where you have the four harmonies, God's life as he originally intended it to be, 
and it would be there contingent on one thing. <laughs> what was that? Obedience. Big trouble. Disobedience enters in and the harmony is lost. But God hasn't given up. That's grace. That's mercy. That's love. And so God provides the answer in the cross. And now, Mr. Believer says yes and takes the cross and moves into this life with Jesus. So he said, I have a new name. I am now a child of the King. I am, I'm, I'm Christian. I am a follower of Jesus. I'm a person of the way. And now I begin to live the life as God originally intended it to be before sin came into the world. And we like to snap our fingers and say, it'll happen just that quick. And it'll all get shaped up just the way God intended it. And it'll be all complete and done. But you and I know that that's neither realistic in terms of how it works in our life, and it is not realistic in terms of how the Bible portrays it. The Bible portrays the Christian walk to be one where we grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as Peter puts it. Grow is the name of the game. And not to grow is to raise a question whether or not there was a birth. Because it is a part of the nature, not only of physical life, but also of spiritual life, to grow. That is what God has built into us and what he intends for his children. So that is the thing. Now, I'm going to repeat a story that we have gone over before. But for this, because it fits so well here and because others need to hear it, I'm going to talk about that college chaplain. College chaplain led one of the students in the dorm to faith in Jesus Christ. So now this college fella is clinging to the cross. And he's lived, you know, a life of the world. And so the chaplain would meet with him week by week. And after a month or so, in meeting and praying with him and studying the Bible, uh, the chaplain says, how's it going? And uh, the student says, well, that all depends. And the chaplain said, depends on what? Well, he said, I feel like there is a uh, civil war going on inside of me. I got two opposing things going on. It's kind of like a white dog and a black dog. And uh, the black dog uh, pulls me back to my old patterns and ways. And, and the white dog pulls me in the way of Jesus Christ. And the chaplain said, well, which dog is winning? <laughs> and the man said, it depends which dog I feed. And you know, that's just a, a folksy little story. But it is so profound, so profound. We need constantly be drinking in what God has provided to feed that new nature. See, the Bible talks about the fact that you can be a baby Christian or you can become a, a mature Christian. There's milk and there's meat. You know that the Bible talks about that. All right. We need constantly to be growing and feeding and that will lead us so that we don't plateau or move backward, but we can say, yes, I am growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you know something? When our time on earth is finished, and that leads us into this stairway, so that at the end of that time, whenever that is, I'm going to finish the job. I'm going to finish the job of bringing you totally back to human life as I intended it to be in the first place. And I have a place prepared for you. Now, I want to read a passage that uh, indicates that kind of thing. And uh, that is found in the Epistle of John. <clears throat> and 
it reads as follows. First epistle of John, chapter 3. See how very much our Heavenly Father loves us, for he allows us to be called his children. And we really are. But the people who belong to this world don't know God, so they don't understand that we are his children. Yes, dear friends, we are already God's children. And we can't even imagine what we will be like when Christ returns. But we do know that when he comes, we will be like him. Jesus, true man. Jesus, the one who shows us what humankind, as God originally designed us to be, looks like. We shall be like him. For we will see him as he really is, and all who believe this will keep themselves pure, just as Jesus is pure. Now I have a question for you. That stairway there that talks about the fact that when our time comes to leave this life, and the Lord takes us, uh, are, can we be sure that that's going to be heaven for us? Can you be sure that you know that you are saved? That's the question, the classic question that people, I've heard that since I was a child. And there was a church in uh, my neighborhood that answered the question in the negative. And when they served communion in that church, only a handful of people would come to receive it. It was really based on the fact that they felt you really couldn't be sure of your eternal security, as we sometimes put it, or to be sure that you are saved. Is that biblical? Is that really what Christ wants? Second question is, is it necessary to have an assurance of your salvation in order to go to heaven? Well, those are questions we're going to discuss in a minute, but I'm going to wrap up this study by taking a look at the last item, and that's this placid lake. Wouldn't you like to go fishing on that lake tomorrow morning at the crack of dawn? <laughs> what does that lake symbolize? That lake symbolizes all of God's creation. You and I know pretty well that when we talk about salvation, Jesus Christ as Savior, we predominantly think about Jesus Christ saving people. And it is that, first and foremost. But it is not only that. There are passages in Scripture, and the classic one is in, in uh, Romans chapter 8, that clearly tells us that God also is going to restore and redeem the rest of his creation. All creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. One of the reasons I guess I, I like the New Living Translation is that it, it, it is fresh. That's stated differently than I have heard it in the other translations that I've used so much of my lifetime. But one of the reasons why I like a new translation is because it says it in fresh words and it and it stabs me wide awake. Wow! Isn't that great? So, if you really get into a time when you need to get into a careful word study, and then you may need to go to a more literal translation like the NIV or the new RSV. But for our reading now, this is, this is good. This is good. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are Against its will, everything on earth was subject to God's curse. There you have disharmony with nature. Okay. All creation anticipates the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. And we can stop the reading there. It says enough. And in the book of the epistle of Peter, the second of those two letters. In the third chapter, you have Peter making a wonderful statement, which is akin to what Paul wrote in Romans 8. It's simply stated that we look forward 
to a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. A new heaven and a new earth. So God is going to renovate and reclaim and restore all of creation. Not just people, but his whole creation. A new heaven and a new earth. And so we close this study with a simple statement. Wow! We ought to have hearts full of praise and thanksgiving and adoration for such a wonderful Savior and a wonderful Redeemer. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.